Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Natasha Harvey and on behalf of Everbridge, an international SOS, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, Something Has Happened, Where Are My Travelling Staff and Are They OK? Before we start the webinar, I'll run through some housekeeping. You're all on listen-only mode, but you can submit questions at any time during the webinar in the open text field and make sure you send your questions to all panellists. We're aiming to cover as many questions as we can at the end of today's session. An email has been sent out to you this morning from the BCI to confirm if you're happy for your information to be shared. Uh, please make sure you respond to this email um, when the webinar is over to confirm that you're happy for them to do that. So I'd now like to introduce our presenters for today. Phil Pate is the director at Everbridge. Phil leads a team that work with many large and medium-sized organisations in the UK to help keep people safe and businesses running faster. And we have Mamsa Talinani, Regional Head of Digital Client Success Team at International SOS. Mamsa heads up the Digital Client Success Team. Her team manage over 300 clients, including many of the big multinational companies. So I'd now like to hand over to Phil to start today's presentation. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, just to share a, a little bit about the two organizations, um, who we are, what we do. So I'll, I'll kick off on Everbridge. Um, so we're a global software as a service company that provides uh, critical event management solutions to about 3,500 customers globally. And when we say customers, uh, with, those are private uh, corporate entities. Uh, about 8,000 odd public bodies uh, around the world also. So we help those organizations recognize when a risk event that is internal or external to their organization may impact the things that they care about, primarily their, their people, their assets, their infrastructure. Uh, we look about 100 different types of risk around the world. We've got a couple of hundred million users uh, in 200 countries. Um, the smart ones among you will say that's six more than are recognized by the UN. Uh, just to flag that, we look at a country as something that has its own telco infrastructure, so you end up with uh, dependencies uh, and others, such as a good example here in uh, in UK would be Channel Islands, has its own telco infrastructure, something we need to be aware of, but it doesn't necessarily have its own seat. Um, I will hand over to uh, Mamta now to tell a little bit about International SOS. Hello, everyone. International SOS is the world's leading medical and travel security assistance company. We are in the business of saving and protecting lives. From more than 1,000 locations in 90 countries, we also have around 26 assistance centers and 62 clinics. With just over 11,000 employees led by 5,200 medical professionals, we service multinational companies, governments, and NGOs globally. Okay, just to share a little bit about our, our joint approach, um, we have much more than just a, a commercial or paper partnership. We have a deep technical integration between the two organizations. Um, reason being, as we just shared, we both have uh, different specialisms, but those come together uh, and solve uh, a problem that we're going to talk about today, particularly around traveling staff. Uh, something has happened. Where are my traveling staff? Are they okay? The two organizations have unique skill sets and unique capabilities within that. And when they come together uh, within, so Everbridge, this world of instant communications, uh, and mass communications, and automating instant response, and international air services capability in uh, travel tracking and medical security assistance, bringing those two pieces together to identify which uh, employees are impacted within a specific uh, event, being able to communicate to those individuals in the way they need to be communicated to, uh, the tasks they need to, to take uh, and advise people that need to be aware. So that's the reason for, for coming together today is, or, or coming together as two organizations. In terms of using uh, or sharing this topic today, it's really driven from two uh, data sources. One um, is from the Business Continuity Institute's uh, Emergency Communication Report. It's been run for a number of years now. Um, some of the people on the call today, I'm sure, have read that. Something that's been uh, top of mind in the latest report and has been top of mind uh, pretty much since the report started was organizations have uh, a concern 
about the ability to communicate to people who may be within a facility or may be near a facility within uh, following a major event. Uh, that data is also um, uh, married, I guess, to some information sought from international SOS's customer base and market. They run a survey every uh, year. And one of those things you'll see in the top uh, line here, 44% of one of the biggest challenges is being able to communicate with employees uh, during a crisis. So I'm going to hand it back to, to Mamsa to talk a little bit about some of the challenges we saw in 2017 globally and how these could impact. So 2017 really hasn't been a very quiet year, isn't it? I mean, we've had civil unrest, terror attacks, strikes, natural hazards, and these these sort of incidents have had the ability to impact our operations, our people, and our assets. So what you saw on the earlier slide, I'm sure, uh, unfortunately, some of those images would have been uh, familiar to you, having seen them on the news. Some of those uh, events unfortunately got added to as well in France uh, last week. But I just wanted to share that critical events aren't just the things that hit the news, aren't just the, the major events that we see out there. Those are probably the, the most critical and tend to drive the most activity. But actually critical events happen every day and they happen around the world. We have uh, many global customers, there are global customers uh, on this call now that need to manage multiple sets of, of risk that could impact uh, the things that they care about, their buildings, uh, their employees, and particularly their traveling employees, things are happening around the world all the time. They could be major things such as on the right, a terror attack, could be a significant IT outage. That IT outage could be local within their organization due to uh, a significant system failure, power outage, whatever that may be. It could be a much broader uh, IT outage such as uh, the, a major cyber attack that we saw with WannaCry. Um, could be a disease uh, outbreak type situation, um, could be something that's going to disrupt a uh, supply chain, could be uh, a port closure, could be a strike. All of these ultimately can potentially come together as a risk to traveler and worker safety. And these things are happening around the world every day. What we uh, then tend to do is look at a critical event and critical event management. So what defines a critical event? All organizations uh, have assets that they care about. Those assets, I've given us a very broad list here, but I'm sure people on the call would come up with a different list depending on their particular business uh, and their particular use case. But broadly we can say, those are our employees, our travelers, uh, expats, visitors, buildings, facilities, uh, IT systems, reputation, is uh, becoming hugely important uh, as brands, especially in the social world we live in. Uh, supply chain, uh, our key supply routes, our suppliers, as we operate just-in-time models, become more and more uh, critical assets to us as businesses. And then we have a set of risk events. So those could be internal, as we've described here, such as systems failures, disruption uh, to business process, other things, thought, forward, th uh, oh, find the words, fraud or theft. It could be external, as we described, uh, natural disasters, extreme weather, terrorism, crime. What uh, is difficult for an organization to do is being able to monitor all of those risk events in relation to their assets uh, uh, around the world. So if you think we all do this every day when we watch the news, you know, we watch the news and we mentally filter whether uh, we are concerned, whether we care, whether we need to take action. If the news isn't about my particular football team, maybe I'm not so interested. If the news is about a uh, natural disaster in a far-flung part of the world, I care, I care because I'm a human. But do I care professionally? Do I have people, do I have assets, do I have critical parts of my supply chain in that area, and particularly relating to today's subject? Do I have uh, local employees? Do I have traveling employees in that area? And, and how do I find out? When those two pieces come together, that defines a critical event. I've got a risk event that impacts something that I uh, professionally care about. What we see uh, in many businesses is upon that event, the processes become quite disjointed. The data sources to get an answer to some basic questions get very difficult. Lots and lots of questions get asked. 
the processes around being able to bring the, together those uh, answers and make sure that the answers match up get a little complicated. Can that threat data be trusted? Is it, is it from a validated source? Is it from multiple sources? Talked about already, does it impact us? How can we respond to this uh, particular event quickly? The quicker uh, an event can be responded to, typically the more options are available to you to manage that response and the cheaper those options are as well. So if you can get to understanding uh, those two pieces very, very quickly, uh, your options to resolve are greatly increased. But fortunately, the data is siloed in terms of, you know, particularly even if we look at this, today's subject of uh, employees. Employees are listed in static systems such as HR systems that list their official place of work. I, for example, I'm not in my listed place of work within my HR system today. I'm actually sat in International SOS's office in Chiswick, so I'm not where effectively the HR system thinks I'm supposed to be. Uh, there are other ways I could potentially be tracked here. I've got a meeting in my diary that's, uh, that's listed here. Uh, my uh, phone is here. I'm on this webinar. There's other ways that I could be identified. I've logged into this building. So uh, on the Wi-Fi, so there's other ways that I could be potentially tracked in, but those are all siloed sources of information as to where I am. And if you're going to try and do that across an employee base of 10,000, um, things start getting complicated very quickly. And all you're trying to do is ask the, the two answer the two basic questions that are listed below: Where are my employees, and are they safe? So. We talk about a critical event management process, and this can uh, help you through any critical event, and particularly we're going to talk about uh, traveling employees. That is a four-phase process. Uh, that is an assess, comes, is the initial point. That comes back to what I was talking about uh, earlier, is an event has occurred. I need to be aware that there is an event, and I need to be aware that that event impacts something that I care about in this instance my uh, traveling employees and once I've managed to get that I've got a yes to that answer is valid I now need to start locating the impacted people and assets how many people who are they are they there are they in transit to that location and once I've then got to work my way through the, the locate piece I can then get into act and that is being able to rapidly take the two pieces of information from assess and locate and drive a set of actions out to those people. Firstly, to let them know, let people know to, uh, that need to know to take an action to start driving activity around the, the resolution. Uh, and all of this sits in a core of being able to communicate and collaborate and share information and being able to visualize and be able to see uh, on a map, what's happened and what is impacting in a, in a very visual way. The last piece I'll cover a little later in, in the analyze, which is the after action that says, okay, how do we do following uh, that critical event? So if I uh, kick off on assess, assess means being able to monitor all the different risk data sources that are out there. The news channel is going to provide you information after it's occurred and after it was important enough to be put on Sky News, CNN, BBC, whatever, which may well be important enough for the uh, watching public uh, to be flagged to, but events that are important to you as an organization may not be important enough to, to make the news. And being able to track, I'm not going to go through all of these, uh, and there's not even 100 up there, but all the different risk sources that could be out there, ideally being able to be advised of those in advance from an awareness point of view. If you're going to be traveling to a location that is subject to these kinds of events, having something that advises your traveling employees before they even uh, take the trip, these are the things that you need to be aware of in this particular location. So there's an, an assess phase there. Uh, and then we get into locate, and I'm going to hand over to, to Mam to talk a little bit about uh, locate. And so how do we locate our travelers? How do we locate the people who are in the diff in the impact zone? Technology, of course, helps us there, and we have the travel tracker solution, uh, uh, which helps us to track our travelers. 
uh, and present to us a global overview of where the different, uh, you know, where people are at different times and on the back of incidents to be able to easily locate them. How do we get the data in the system? We partner with the organizations or we work with organizations preferred travel management companies. So that's the major data source. And of course, then there are the different data, data sources of having people to check in via their app and that check-in feeds into the travel tracker. There is the ability to connect with the Uber solution to capture the Uber drop-offs as well. But basically, the most important data source being the travel management companies and consolidating and presenting that data via the tracking solution allows you now to have a global overview of your travel travelers and to be able to locate them on the back of any incident. Okay, so once we've got uh, through that, we end up into the second phase uh, of locate. I'm going to start at the right-hand side of this slide. You see uh, a list there. When we think about employees, I've already talked about static location. For example, my static location is at our offices in uh, in Maidenhead. My last known, and these are the, if, as you work your way through this list, the earlier slide where I showed the arrows asking lots of different questions, when I speak to organizations when an event has occurred, actually they are going through this process, but in a very ad hoc way, interrogating lots of different data sources to identify who is supposed to be there? So that's a, a static location. Are they actually uh, available uh, in work on shift? That would hit availability potentially on call. Are they scheduled to be there? No, actually, I can see their holiday records. They're not even uh, in that location right now. They're on vacation. Uh, last known could be, did, they do, did those people badge in to that office in that location? Uh, many, most uh, app building access control systems have an export function to be able to, to look at that, but that's all after the event and pulled together over um, potentially hours and days afterwards, not in real time. Uh, and from a expected location, can I go through their, 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 uh, their diary, their travel plans, their travel bookings to be able to see where I think they were supposed to be? And I'll come on to skills uh, and needs in a minute. But that list is uh, a manual process in many organizations today and can take uh, hours or potentially days to collect that information uh, to identify uh, those two basic questions. Where are my employees and are they safe? So those things get you to where they are. There are uh, tools and capabilities that we have together as, uh, as partners that can help with that and provide it in real time and connect all of those things that you would have done post the event actually in advance and have it ready to uh, to be able to to pull up those lists as you can see in the middle box here you can see a list uh, referring to an instant uh, in germany i've got 17 employees there now i've got another 17 uh, due to be there in the next 24 hours and another 28 that are going to be there in the next week or so so being able to pull that potentially together in real time once you've got i now know uh, who's impacted, uh, and these are the individuals uh, that are there. I then need to think about who can help. So if we go to the three questions on the right, those are the, uh, the three questions that we're looking to answer. Who's impacted will be covered. Who can help? So that comes into skills and needs. So based upon the people that could respond to this, do I have first aid skilled people in that location? Do I have uh, people that uh, can potentially rebook travel that might need to be done to find alternative accommodation, uh, provide a medical evacuation if that's required? Start to work out who's available and on call with those skills that can support the uh, critical event we're dealing with right now. Um, needs uh, is also interesting. Uh, we live in a world with people with many different needs. There may be an, a, an individual who has uh, needs around uh, uh, physical impairments or something else that may limit their ability to maybe get audio in an airport. We need to drive uh, communications to them uh, on email or text in another way because uh, they're going to have to absorb that information through, through, through a different channel. And the last one is who needs to know. If this event is important, uh, is significant and likely to hit the press, uh, maybe the press office needs to know. The executive is always going to want to know. Even if they're not impacted, this impacts the, the people they're responsible for, the assets they're responsible for, the infrastructure they're responsible for. They need to know what's happening, get that status report, and when the next one's going to be coming in and when they can uh, potentially be updated upon that. So all of those pieces uh, come together within that locate phase, which then very quickly 
follows into that act, and that is about driving a specific set of communication, not a uniform set, a specific set around the event, around the individuals that are impacted in that specific geography. So having a standard operating procedure within uh, a tool set that says, based on, if this event occurs, I want to drive uh, these set of communications. It goes out multimodally, so that would be uh, in a very broad sense, uh, SMS, email, voice calls, to utilize the channels of communication that all of us already have, already have multiple sets of communication paths that we have as individuals being able to aggregate those and drive the same message out in sequence across all of those to make sure we get the message uh, through. And that message being uh, specific to the individual type and the event type. So that may be just an awareness because you're uh, in, near the area, advised please don't, uh, be, uh, don't enter this area. Or actually, you know, you're a, a responder, you have a set of skills that are useful to assist in the response to this please can you join this conference bridge uh, to uh, add to your expertise to the solution and ultimately uh, have a secure collaboration method within that as well. So once this set of communications has been driven out, been able to bring people together to work uh, upon the resolution and hopefully bring uh, everything back to, to normality and have a nice quick sort of resolution upon that, we then get into that analyze phase to say, okay, we've resolved the event, we've managed to uh, identify all of our individuals are, have been notified, we've got everybody checked in, everybody's safe, they're not actually impacted by the incident. How did we do? How did uh, the other industry bodies, other companies do? How can we compare that against a set of benchmarks? Have an auditable after action report that can be pulled together out of the system, say who was told what, where and when? Um, how did different teams do within that and how can we measure the operation response and be able to bring that together to say how can we improve this next time around, what lessons are learned, uh, how can this be improved going forward. So just bringing that into, into uh, a close and a reminder, critical event management, a four-step process, uh, assess phase, what has happened, does it impact my traveling uh, staff and individuals, where are those people, locate, being able to pull those people together uh, and getting into a short list very quickly, an act phase of being able to drive communications to those individuals of who needs to know, what actions do they need to take around that specific event, uh, and the last phase being an uh, after action analysis, being able to uh, compare yourself against others and say what can we do to improve our response if there's a next time. So that brings me to the end of our short presentation today. Um, is there anything you wanted to add, Dante? No? Okay. Um, just in terms of questions, I'll just thank, pass over. Thank you, Phil, and thank you, Mamta. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Everbridge or International SOS and how we make it faster and easier for organizations to account for their remote and traveling employees, our contact information is on the screen. And at this point, we're going to move to our question and answer portion of the session. Please remember to keep continuing to submit any questions that you have. Okay, so we have a few questions to take a look at. Um, first one, if this solution is using GPS to monitor staff, is this a privacy issue? Okay, so uh, just I'll pick up on that. So one of the facets of the tool is to be able to use GPS as a method of identifying an individual's location. But let's be clear, that's the individual's choice. In the same way, all of us have mobile phones today that are checking into Google Maps, into Apple, um, into Facebook. So your, your device is already sharing your information uh, to a, a central point of where that device is. Your, within your device, you have the option to allow GPS or that particular application to access the GPS on your device. You can turn it off as a, as a uniform across all of the um, 
applications or allow specific uh, devices, specific apps within device to access GPS. That's your choice as an individual. Um, and you may choose to switch that on and off um, in the same way I do. Uh, I have, uh, a, the, as an employee of Everbridge, I have these applications on my phone. I choose not to actively check in everywhere I go. Um, however, if I'm entering a, a part of the city which may be a little unfriendly or I'm entering a location which I perceive is high risk, um, I may choose to switch that on uh, and activate that and do a, a, an auto check-in because for that period of time, I may feel a little bit more at risk. But it certainly doesn't need to be a, a uniform thing and there's no capability within the system to turn on a map and actively see and monitor and see a lot of dots walking around uh, in terms of these are, these are my employees. You need to launch an incident to that and it captures who's in that zone. Not It's not an active tool. Thank you. Okay, next question. Where does the solution get information from about world events like terrorism? So uh, we have uh, multiple sources that would come from, from uh, news feeds through to uh, RSS, through to um, adv government advisories, uh, through to social media, We're constantly scanning uh, the multiple sources that are out there to validate threats uh, as we see them. So. That, to be clear, uh, if you look at the different ways an event gets uh, gets reported, events can get reported um, through news. And if you look at a news reporter, a news reporter can describe what they see. And I'll come to a specific in a minute. If you talk to someone like the uh, City of London Police, they will push out a communication when they know what is going on. So I'll, I'll, I'll bring this to life. We look at uh, Parliament Square. Uh, when we drove out uh, communications on that, the first we saw was a report that said shots fired in Parliament Square. And actually, that was the end of the uh, event. Everything happened so quickly and that got driven out. We didn't know what had occurred at that point. If then look at what came out after um, and the news teams are on the ground reporting what they see uh, and that's live and updated as it goes. We would continue to refine that information as it gets driven out. Uh, and then if you look at something like came from the CLN police, these guys need to report fact. They cannot uh, report uh, what they suspect. They report fact and their, their information comes out a little bit later. So in that very specific instance, I'm going to use three data sources there to drive an initial communication that's very time specific and may not be 100% uh, final information at that point, drive updates and then drive a, a final resolution and close. So. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, will check-in via the app give Travel Tracker a degree of accuracy based on how reliable the handset GPS reading is? Happy to take that question. Um, the, the app determines the location by a number of different methods, depending of course on the availability at that time. So it's either a cell tower, Wi-Fi or GPS. The app location taps into the device's same methods of attaining location like like any of your other apps, Facebook, um, we, we have a question on that would we'll do, but it basically taps into the device's same methods of attaining location, which is either the cell tower, Wi-Fi, or GPS, whatever is available at that point, to determine the best and most precise location and present that to you via the tracking tool. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, following communication with travelers on the back of an incident, what is recommended um, in case of non-responding travelers? Okay, hey, that's, that's really a very good question, and our, um, and our security experts can explain the protocol or discuss in detail. Generally, the steps to take for non-responding travelers on the back of a communication for people who have failed to respond is, you know, you, you try to send another message, you try to call the individual on any other phone numbers that you have saved for them. You will identify those with incorrect contact details and find the correct contact details for them. Maybe that's one of the reasons why uh, you, you know, fail to obtain a response. Uh, you would try to check the itinerary and location details to clarify where the individual was at the time of the incident. Maybe try contacting colleagues on the same trip. Um, check on social media as well. So maybe this person is not reachable, but they have, you know, they're, they're communicating with people via Facebook. Uh, or, or uh, And so that's one way of checking. Contacting the head of the department, other colleagues, HR, family members even. Uh, contacting next of kin. So these are a couple of different uh, steps you would take. Um, but definitely, if you need further information, uh, you, you can uh, contact us, and, and we're more than happy to put you in contact with our security or medical experts who can who can explain in more details. Okay, thank you. Let's take a, a few more. 
Um, when does the solution... No, go on. Why would we use this solution and not rely on WhatsApp or Facebook for safety checking? So um, social media has its place uh, within that. So social media, if you think of something like WhatsApp or Facebook, uh, it's an ability to drive a message to a large group of people. But that is, they're also getting updates from uh, Donald Trump, from uh, celebrity X factor, whatever that's driving through. So not necessarily hitting, not necessarily hitting the, the, the top of their feed. Uh, and also they need to be signed up to that feed. And there's no method of being able to track response. If you're going to drive that out to uh, a, a thousand employees, how do you track the response in a format that says, okay, I now need to look into account for those individuals. Everybody's potentially a full, res responded in free form, assuming they've responded, you know, into a huge manual aggregation to be able to, to uh, count responses, uh, even if you could, uh, you could get there. So hopefully that answers that question. Mm -hmm. So final question. Um, regarding the act phase, you talked about the communication and identifying who needs to know. Can international SOS play a role in that phase in case an individual needs assistance? Great. Absolutely. On the back of an incident and that you have now started contacting your people, depending on the responses, uh, we, we explained what you, you know, the protocols follow for non-responders. But in addition to that, if someone's, you know, if, if any particular individual really needs assistance, then um, as we explained during the slides, we are a medical and security risk uh, 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 assistance company. And, uh, and mostly security incidents, they will always have some or the other medical element to it as well. And even if they don't, if it's just purely a security incident. Contacting our assistance centers means we have on the ground people that we can deploy to be able to support this individual, uh, you know, to make direct contact with them, to keep the uh, communication lines um, open and, you know, uh, assuring them that we, we, we are there to assist them as well as deploy our on the ground people to, so if there's an evacuation that's required, then to then to be able to uh, do that as well and along along with all this to follow the organization's own customized operational procedures to keep the uh, main contacts informed at at any point uh, where we need to refer this individual to a nearest clinic or maybe evacuate them to a nearest uh, center of medical excellence then then those are the kind of services that international SOS will uh, will deploy uh, again um, you know, making sure that the organization uh, is made up to date, informed and uh, made aware of these uh, of these actions. Okay, thanks. Okay. We'll just do one more. Can this be integrated with Active Directory? Auto removal of details of employee leaves the company, has data protection, DDPR touch points to remove personal contact details? Yes, I think the, uh, the uh, question is, can the system be driven from uh, the core HCM system or record within the organization or active directory? The short, the short answer is yes, and that's the vast majority of the way uh, the tools get implemented with our customer base. So you're looking for a core system or record, uh, whether that's active directory or the uh, HCM system, it says, do I have an employee? Uh, are they still on the payroll, yes or no? So that starts with that core record, and that core record would hold a set of um, uh, personal information of that individual. The individual then may choose to add additional information that wouldn't be captured potentially in the HCM to the Everbridge tool. That may be their personal mobile numbers or other things, and that's their choice. So it's all opt-in. There's no mandatory piece within that. The individual's chosen to provide that and provide into and upload additional contact paths because they recognize it's a safety tool and, and to drive uh, effective communication to them. But the master record always always mates to the Active Directory or HCM. So when that individual leaves the company, the master record disappears along with all of the any other additional information that's been uh, added and opted in to that by the individual. So hopefully that answers that one. That's it. Okay. So um, if you have any additional points that you'd like to discuss, please get in touch, and we'll be happy to help. And as a reminder, to keep an eye out for the Communicating Risk with the Global Workforce Report, um, which will be available soon. Thank you all again for your participation in today's webinar. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.